So actually, in the last uh, lecture, we looked at this uh, SDFT. And we, it was basically a prediction that uh, if we looked at the, so remember, we looked at these the density-density fluctuations at different times in Fourier space. So that object is a dynamical structure factor. In spatially, translationally invariant systems, this defines SK of T. And uh, SK of Z, so the prediction was that uh, SK of T is, was equal to, we sort of slightly cheated, but so we, if you write everything in terms of the structure function, then you should find something like this. Okay, and I said that uh, one of the nice things about this theory is that so we wrote, when you write when you write down the uh, SDFT, uh, you derive this equation by starting from the Brownian particle description, the density of Brownian particles. But if you were to just look at this equation, right? If you looked at the equation I wrote down with this strange noise, it looks like some horrible uh, stochastic partial differential equation with multiplicative noise. So if you didn't know where it came from you probably couldn't solve it. And people have actually, you know, analyzing this equation is very difficult. So this is what comes out of a linearized approximation. And I said this actually works for free Brownian particles. Because if I, if I start off with free Brownian particles, actually, I can write that the position of the particle i at time t is given by its position at zero, which will assume for, free, for a free gas, this will just be uniform, right? If there are no interactions in a finite volume, this will be uniform, and then we have the square root of 2d times a Brownian motion bi evaluated at time t, right? And these are all independent. So xi0 is uniformly distributed over the volume v. V, which is the volume of the system, okay? Um, so if I take the Fourier transform of the density, then you basically find that rho tilde of k is equal to the sum over i, and then you have e to the minus i k dot x i of t. So if you put this form in here, it just gives you the sum over i minus i k, then you have x i of zero, um, plus the square root of 2d times b i of t. Okay, um, so the first thing to notice is that, so there are two averaging. If I want to look at the statistics, there are two things that are potentially random in this system. There's the Brownian motion, which is generated from t equals zero to t, from t equals zero up to the current time t. But there's also the initial position of the particles, okay? So if we assume that it's uniformly distributed, so you have two averages. You have, so if I, I can define this, this is the average over the initial conditions. And I also have, I can you know, write this average here. This is an average over the Brownian motion. Okay, so if I, um, if I just calculate the average value of rho tilde of k, so this is equal to, so in principle I should average over the Brownian motion, but I've got a double average. So this average zero, I mean this is just the average one over the volume, the integral of dx zero, right? Write it like this. Okay, just the integral over the uniform distribution. So when I compute this guy here, you see, if I take this average over the initial conditions to start with, actually, uh, sorry, yes, I k, what happens is that I just um, integrate this 
over x0. And if I look at something like uh, e to the minus i k dot x0, so if I integrate this over the x0, this gives me 1 over v. Um, and if I take the limit, v goes to infinity. Um, so I can keep the v here, but here I'll take the limit, v goes to infinity. I have e to the i k dot x dx, right? And we know that's the delta function at k equals 0. So this is 1 over 2 v times 2 pi to the d times delta of k. So you can see that when I do that average, it puts delta of k here, so the k becomes zero, so actually this becomes independent of the Brownian motion. So you find that rho tilde of k is just going to be equal to um, one over v times the sum i is equal to one up to n of two pi to the d delta of k. So that's equal to two pi to the d delta of k and then each, so these terms are identical, so you just have n over v. So this is just equal to 2 pi to the d delta of k times rho bar. I mean, I could have done this in real space, right? I could have taken the average value of rho, which would have been rho bar. So this is just the Fourier transform of a constant, okay? Yeah, it means I'm doing both, yeah? I mean, I, okay, if you want to, I should really do... I'm doing both. So let's have a look. Let me calculate now the uh, the density density correlation function. Uh, so let me just look at. So I should take the average. So if I take rho tilde of k, rho tilde of k prime. Okay. Um, perhaps I'll leave this as an exercise for the tutorials. Um, what you find this is given to. So there are two terms. So you look at the term, the sum. You basically find this is 2 pi to the d times rho bar times delta of k plus k prime times e to the minus k squared dt. So that comes from the cross terms. If you, if you do the calculation, check out the cross terms in the sum. And then the last term in the limit of large volume is just actually the, the, the average value of the density, the Fourier transform of density squared, right? So you have delta. Delta of k squared, right? So now, if I so if I want to get the the, the fluctu, if I want to calculate the correlation function, the fluctuations, I have to subtract off this average value here squared to compute the variance. So this just gives so the only term it kills off this term here. So I just get two pi to the d delta of k plus k prime e to the minus k squared dt. So this means that the dynamical structure factor for free Brownian particles is s of k of t is equal to rho bar e to the minus k squared dt. So you see here the s of k of zero, the, the static structure factor is just equal to rho bar. And we had a formula over here somewhere so if, S, if, I, if I put uh, S of k is equal to rho bar, you see I get exactly this formula here. Okay, so this means that uh, the SDFT is the correct result for free particles. It seems like a sort of trivial thing, but there are actually lots of, you know, there are approximations that don't, actually, don't always respect this. Okay, um, that was section 2.5, free Brownian particles. Okay. Okay, so where things become interesting uh, is if you have lots of different types of particles, okay? So if I have 2.6, the generalization to different species of particles. So if we're going to do electrolytes, right, we need to do this.
this is very easy to verify, um, is that so if, if I call my particles alpha is in it, a label of particle type, okay, um, d alpha is the diffusion constant. Particles of type alpha. What else do I have? Um, so if my particles interact, right, um, I'm going to say that V alpha beta of X, which is obviously going to be equal to V beta alpha of X, although if you wanted to do some sort of strange Act, you know, non-equilibrium uh, active system, you could perhaps uh, uh, avoid uh, saying that. That's the interaction. That's a pairwise interaction. Between particles of type. I can also have a little new alpha x, an external potential. Acting on particles of type alpha. Okay, so I think this is one of the areas where this method is useful. So now when I'm looking at correlation functions, obviously there's a, there's a structure. I'm going to have not just n, al n tilde, n tilde. I can have n tilde alpha, n tilde beta because I have the particle indices. And so the SDFT for, the, for that system takes, you can almost guess it, d, re, d rho alpha by dt. So this is the equation for the species of type alpha is equal to the divergence of d alpha times rho alpha, the gradient of d by d rho alpha at x, of beta of h, plus the divergence of the square root of 2 d alpha rho alpha, with a noise eta, which has a particle has an alpha on it now, right? So this is the white noise field. And this white noise field has, so now I've got several indices. So I've been putting my spatial indices up at the top. So if I look at eta i alpha of x of t, eta j beta of x prime t prime, that is equal to deltas everywhere right now because we're always getting deltas everywhere so you have deltas in the particle species deltas in the spatial components and deltas in space and deltas in time okay okay and what's the uh, value of h well the value of h is equal to so I have a sum over alpha of t times the integral log of rho of alpha, rho alpha dx. I have the term coming from the external potential. So this is, uh, I can put, keep the sum over alpha here. So I can have v alpha of x, rho alpha of x dx. And then the interaction term is going to be plus a half the sum over alpha and beta V of alpha beta, oh, yeah, the integral. Rho alpha of x, rho beta of y. V alpha beta, x minus y. So there are really no surprises there, right? This is exactly what you would expect to write down. As, you know, you saw that somehow this naive mean field energy functional was appearing, but not with the value of the mean field. So this is the internal energy. This is the, interac the, the interaction energy between all the 
possible combinations of particles. So that's, uh, we can see, so when you start looking at systems with two types of particles, when you write down the equations for the, the correlation function, right, you're going to have n alpha, n beta, so you're going to be looking at, if, if things become diagonal in Fourier space, you're going to be looking at two by two matrices. Um, if you have three particle types, you go to three by three, et cetera, et cetera. And so it becomes quite, quite complicated looking equations. Now, the last thing I want to talk about is, because I want to talk about how other ways of deriving these sorts of equations without using Ito calculus, I want to talk about, I'm not going to solve it straight away, but I'm going to talk about the Martin Sigia Rose half integral. Actually, what I'd like to be able to do, so if you have a, you know, if you, if you have a random variable, you have a probability distribution, right? Um, and so I might want to know what the probability distribution of the field N is at some time T. But I, formally, I can ask, what is the probability distribution of the path? Okay? <clears throat> and so what I'm going to do is, let's go back to uh, a discrete stochastic differential equation. So I'm going to write it, I'm going to divide by dt. So typically at time, if I look at time i, the change in the process at time i is going to be equal to ui of x evaluated at i. So this is the, com this is, sorry, this is the component plus a i j x. So this is at yeah, this is at time t. Okay, times d b um, i t divided by delta t. So that's what my uh, discrete stochastic differential equation looks like. And actually, so formally, the probability to observe, so I'm looking at this at discrete points, right? So I'm going to have a value at x0, x1, etc. So I'm looking at something like this. So I'm starting off here at x0. I've got x1, x2 at time t2. Okay? So I'm going to write, well, I think I called this t0, t1, t2, t3, right? So actually, I'm going to write down the joint probability distribution to be at x0 at time t0, to be at x1 at time t1, and to be at sorry, x of t, little x of t1, little x of t0, little x of tn, right? So actually, what I should do is, what I'll do is to make this simpler, I'll write random variables as capital letters and variables in probability densities as small letters, right? So this is just the probability that at time t0, this random variable xt0 is equal, equal to little xt0, right? It's the density, okay? It's the, it's the probability density for this to be in some interval around here, okay? So I want to know what that is. So the point is, obviously we know that a probability density function, right, is just the average value of a delta function, a random variable. So what we're going to do is we're going to say, well, that must be if I average over the noise, this is just the product over i is equal to 1 up to n. The delta function of x of ti minus little x of ti. Okay, this is just the, okay, so this is the, this is just how you can, you know, if you have a random variable, we see that the, the probability density function is just the expectation value of the delta function, okay? So you want to compute that. <laughs> okay, so if we were lucky, we could say, well, so if we could solve the equation explicitly,
the discrete SDE, this guy here, right? So imagine I could solve it, right? I could just write um, I could just write that uh, xi of t. So what would x of ti be equal to? So if I could solve it explicitly, I'd say, well, this must just be, what can it be a function of? It must be a function of x of, t it must be a function x of at time t1 of ti, sorry. And it must be a function of uh, the initial condition, x0, okay, x at t0, and of all the noises, right? So it must be a function of delta b t1, delta b t2, just up to delta b of t of n, right? If I, if I was, I mean, if, so if this was, for instance, a linear equation, I could solve it, right? And so, so then I would just plug this into the delta function, right? And then I would try and work everything out. But the problem is I might not be able to solve the equation. If it's nonlinear, I can't solve the equation. So how can I make, how can I make this work? Well, you have, so... The, Oh, sorry, no, sorry, it just depends on this, no, it stops at delta ti minus 1, sorry, okay? So it's just the, the noises up to that time, okay? So obviously, it will own, only ti plus 1 will depend on delta eti, okay? So you've got that, so I could, I could do that. So this is the explicit solution, but actually, the differential equation, right, isn't an explicit solution, but it's, as long as the solution was in a unique, in some sense, I don't want to worry about that. Uh, then I have the differential equation is, a, is an implicit formula, right? It's not, it's not an explicit solution. So I can't put that in here. Okay. But actually, so what is the, what is the, implicit, the implicit equation? Is that A i of x t i, which is equal to x, I of T I, so I'm writing it in coordinates, divided by delta T. Okay, okay sorry. I don't want to do that straight away. So I, what I'm going to do is, so I'm, I'm interested in this, uh, I'm, I'm interested in this, uh, in, in this function here, right? I'm interested in this. Let me just look at, imagine I fix T0, x, x of T0 and T0, right? And let me just look at what happens in the first time. Let me just look at P of x t0 to x t1, yeah? If I, w I can work out that, I can just iterate the process, okay? So let me look at, uh, consider, yeah, of x t0, x t1, right? So, but I'm going to fix, this guy's fixed, right? So what I want to be able to do is, so in principle, I should, this should, this is just equal to, so if I, if I fixed T0, this is just equal to delta of, so if I fix this guy, little x T0, this is equal to delta of x T0. If I, sorry, if I fix this, right, this is not just, this is, um, this is just, the expected value of delta of little x of t1 minus big x of t1, right? Given that I fix this to be little x of t0, okay? Now, the thing is that if I write down the equation for x of t1, I have an equation of the... With this, the discrete equation becomes x of t1 minus little x of t0 divided by delta t. I'm just writing the differential equation is equal to u of little x of t0 plus this, uh, so I need to put indices i here, i, i of t0, so this is ui plus aij of little x of t0 times um, dbj divided by delta t, right? So that's my differential equation. So when you look at that, 
you can see that, uh, so this, I'm going to say that this equation, sorry, I'm going to write this with a minus sign. I'm going to say that's equal to zero. Okay, so this is the discrete form of the stochastic differential equation for x at time t1 if I fix x at t0, right? But you can see that, uh, so this equation has a form of... Uh, ax of t1 is equal to zero, where this defines this equation, right? This is, this, this, all this guy here is ax of t1. Um, so, oh, sorry, this is, yeah, this is, so, so this is, so this, this is a random variable. This is a function of this little, this is, sorry, yeah, it's not clear uh, because of the size of the letters, right? This coordinate here, this is just a coordinate in a probability density function, right? This is this guy here. This is the random variable. Okay, so I'm, it's the average value, yeah. Okay, so when I take the average, it's just a value of this, right? So I have a, an, an implicit equation for ax of t1 is equal to, z, is equal to 0. <clears throat> OK. And so actually, sorry? Sorry, say it louder. Yeah, yeah, this, this, so this, this, this is a function a of x i of t1, yeah? It's defining this function. Yeah. Well, it is a product form, it's... No, 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 it doesn't. No, you're thinking about independence, right? The, it's always given by the, the, the product of delta functions. The independence means that this product doesn't factorize. You can't, you can't write it as the product of expectation values, right? This is just uh, always true with the delta functions, right? Okay, you can, it's easy to see that. Okay, so yes, what he was saying was this looks a bit... Uh, so th but this average is outside. I have a product here. If, I can't say that this is equal to the average value of each of these guys, right? So that would be implying independence. But if I have the delta function, I put the average outside, then I'm not assuming anything about independence, right? Yeah, that's right. So yes, yeah, so it's so big X's are the random variables. Okay. And the little x's are the, you know, the, the coordinates in the PDF, the variables. And... Okay. So basically, locally, I can say that. Uh, so delta of x of t1 minus little x of t1, I can impose that by saying, well, locally, that must be... So if, 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 x, if, it, if, if x, little x of t1 is, doesn't take the same value as big x of t1, it must obey the same differential equation, right? So it basically means that uh, you write it like this. little x of t1. So what you've done is you changed the variable. Now, you all know that when you look at delta functions, right? Imagine you want to calculate the delta function. Um, you want to look at uh, delta of x minus xc, right? And instead, you look at a function f which vanishes at xc, right? So you have a function of f which vanishes here. If you look at delta of f of x, for instance, right? What's that equal to? in terms of delta of x. Uh, it's equal to delta of x divided by, if f, if, f, if, x, if f of 0 is equal to 0, right? So the delta function has the same value, but you have to divide by f prime of 0, right? Yeah? 
And this is, but you know, why this is true, right? So the quick way to see this is that a delta function, delta of x, is just equal to 1 divided by dx, right? And so delta of fx, I mean, it has, it has a positive sign, right? So delta of f of x is just equal to 1 over df, right? So delta of x, and in higher dimensions, it's just 1 over the local volume element, right? So when we do that, um, I can say that that... So if I look at this object here, this is just equal to the determinant of t to the minus 1 delta of x, little x, no, which way am I writing it? Delta of, yeah, so this is the small one here. I'm writing, it doesn't matter which way around. t1, this is the big one, okay? So this is just equal to delta of x of t1 minus x of t, big x of t1, right? Where this determinant t, It's just equal to, so the matrix Tij is just equal to Dai by Dxj. Sorry? The first line, oh yeah, sorry, yes, sorry. Yeah, so yeah, so I'm saying it, so let me do something like that, right? So, um, So yes, yeah, so what I want to say is, so if this is not equal to that, but this is equal to that, right? And this, so we have this determinant. So, so you have to be very careful when you change variables. You have to work out what the determinant is. So let me go and look at what happens here. Uh, yes. Uh, oh, sorry, no, these are all big ones, right? This is for A of big X. This is the random equation. So these are all, all these guys are big, right? Okay, so they're all big. But when I look at this equation here, right, what's the, what's the determinant of this, uh, what's the determinant of this equation, right? Well, this is a crucial thing to do with Ito calculus. Look, so we're talking about the variable X of T1, Xi of T1. So this is AI. So actually, this is almost an implicit equation. So it's very important. The only point where this occurs is in this term here. Okay, so you can actually see when I calculate this guy here, this dAi by dx t1 is actually just 1 over dt times delta ij, right? So this guy here is equal to 1 over delta t times delta ij. Okay, so actually, the important thing is that this determinant is independent of x. It's independent of the path. Now, if you look in books where they discuss stochastic calculus and path integrals, a way of writing down path, the Stratonovich prescription, okay, so one thing I didn't want to go into, but you see that the crucial thing about the Ito calculus is that the variable x here is always the variable at t0 at the earlier time. So you say that x of t1 is equal to this, everything on this side of the equation, right, is, just depends on x of t0 on the earlier time. Now, if I did Stratonovich calculus, actually, you'd have a midpoint formula here. Instead of having x of t0, you'd have x of t0 plus x of t1 divided by 2. So then you can see that the determinant will actually depend on the derivative of this matrix. Okay, so we'll find a dependence here. So if you use the Ito calculus, the determinant is independent of the path. So what you can write is, uh, I mean, I'm just doing it for the first step, right? Because, I mean, I can use the Markov property, okay? I can just imagine I fix the propagator before and just do the first step, right? And, and if you look in books, if you try and do it for the whole process at the same time, the matrix, the transfer matrix matrix is, the transformation matrix is diagonal, a triangular diagonal, it's triangular, sorry, and all of the elements on the diagonal are independent of the path, right? So this is, this is, I mean, I guess, have you heard about this business about path integrals and Jacobians and the difference between, uh, between, uh... okay, so you've got that. So basically it means you don't really have to worry too much about, uh, you know, getting this, uh, Jacobian, right? Because it's just a constant, it's independent of the paths. So basically you can write that uh, simply that px, so if I look at the first step, I can look at, I write px of t, little x of t0, x of t1, 
is equal to some constant times the average value of the delta function. So a of x, a of x of t is equal to zero by definition. So what's left in the, del in the delta function is delta of a of little xi, okay, x of t1. Because a of the, I had a term minus a of x, but that's zero. Okay, so this is just equal to a constant times delta of delta of x. So x of t, little x of t minus little x of zero divided by dt. So this, I just write the discrete differential equation minus ui of x zero plus aij x zero delta b i t zero divided by delta t. Okay, so the constant, okay, it'll just be a normalization factor, right? So, you, you, you know, it's like a partition function. The partition, the, if you write down the Gibbs-Boltzmann distribution, it's not necessarily, you normalize it afterwards by calculating the partition function. So, when you do this, <coughs> this means that the, the probability distribution over that I, so let me go to the, conti so if I, I call this, this means a sequence of x of t1, x of t2, x of t3. When I write this, this means x, little x of t0, little x of t1, okay, x of tn. And then over this set of times, so this is t here, so this is equal, these are the sets of times t0, t1. So it basically means I've got n objects here. So this is equal to some normalization factor, and I have the product over all the delta functions over all these times and all of the spatial coordinates of delta of x i dot of t minus u i of x i of x of t plus zeta of i of t, where this is the noise term, right? So I just slightly abused my notation. X dot means, okay, so, so I've gone to a continuum. There's some sort of continuum. This is a product over all times, okay? And I take the expectation value. <coughs> okay, so now what you do is uh, the trick to get to a path integral. I mean, this is just the product of delta functions. You have to be able to average over the noise. So how do you do that? Well, what you do is you before I make this thing become dense, I use the representation of the delta function. Okay, I just say that I can write the delta of remember I can write delta of k is equal to one over two pi to the d times the integral dk of the exponential minus i k. I put a minus sign there, it doesn't matter, it's just the... n is normalization, right? This is a normalization which, uh, yeah, sorry, this is a normalization factor. It comes from the Jacobian, right? So in principle, this Jacobian, you can work it out, the determinant of t is equal to 1 over delta t to the power, uh, so if d is the dimension of the space, right? These are the coordinates. Uh, times, so it's just that, right? It's a diagonal matrix with 1 over delta t as each of its elements. Okay, so in principle, I've got all these factors of 1 over delta t to the n. Um, so this is a representation of the delta function. And so when you write this down, you can go to a continuum limit. I've explained. Oh, that's the integral over x, yeah. Okay, so... The product, the, the probability distribution, the probability to see this path x over this interval of time t is just going to be equal to, so if I write it as a, in, in the discrete form, it's this normalization factor. I have the average value of, so I integrate, so I have a product over all of the times i delta. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to write a delta function representation but I'm going to multiply, I'm going to introduce a variable, a conjugate variable I'm going to call x hat, okay, at the time t, divided by 2 pi to the d. 
Okay, so there's a variable x hat times delta t is a variable. I'm doing that so I, I can write the equation of motion up here as minus i times the sum over t. So the product, the product over all the times in these delta functions, okay, because if I exponentiate them, I'm going to get delta t times x of t hat. So this is just my k, right? This is the k here. Okay, so dk is just this. And then I'm going to stick in the equation of motion here, which is just x dot of s minus u x of s. So this is over discrete points. I haven't written explicitly what the discrete points are for the moment. So uh, minus the noise vector. Okay. Okay, so that's what you get. You see, this is the variable. This is k is delta t times x hat, right? So I've done that. Now, the thing is, I put the delta t in here, this sum over all the discrete times that I was looking at, I can now take a continuum limit, right? So I've multiplied by delta t, this becomes a, you know, this is the, I take the limit, it's a Riemannian integral. And so I'm integrating over all of these discrete points and I'm making them become denser and denser, so I'm going to get a path integral. So I have some new normalization factor and I'm going to get the integral. So this integral here, I take all the factors of pi into the path integral. This, I write the standard path integral notation. This is the integral over all paths little x hat of t, all the possible values, I have the expo exponential of minus i. So now this becomes the integral between 0 and t, and I just have this x hat of s, use s as the internal variable now, t is the final time, so this is just x dot of t minus u x of s minus zeta of t, right? So actually, after all that, basically what you do is you just take the equation of motion and you just stick it in the, you just stick it in uh, in this form here. So this is called the MSR path integral, and there's an expectation, right? So, so once I take the expectation, you see this is actually. So x hat is an integration variable. So this is telling you what the probability. This is telling you what the probability of seeing the path x of t is. Okay. So if I fix a certain path x, x of t, it looks like that. S. It's this is. Oh, sorry. Yeah, this is just s here. It's the integration variable in this path. Okay. So t is the time, the final time. And I've just got rid of t. I've replaced it with s. Okay. Okay, so you just take this stochastic equation of motion. If you're using Ito, you don't have a problem with the change of variables, right? So the Jacobian just gives you a constant. So you just take your stochastic differential equation, you write the, the equation of motion here, you integrate it across an, another field, you take the scalar product with x hat of s, do the integral minus, and then you integrate over the noise, okay? Yes. Uh, let me see. Oh, well, no, it was T here. Sorry, it was T. I'm still using the notation T here, okay? Okay? So that's what you've got. So I just... Uh, this sum here. So this is, this is... So this sum over I, this was... I was writing a discrete thing, okay? So basically I had times at X of T0. Uh, I had X at T1 x at t2, right, up, up to x of tn, right? So I have, instead of doing, I was looking at the process at these discrete times, and I was taking the limit as these intervals go to zero. Yeah? This, here. Where is, yeah, yeah, it's, t, yeah, it's the ti's, yes, okay. There are just too many indices in these calculations. Sorry? The noise term is positive. Oh, it's, sorry, it's a minus sign here, because it's, uh, okay? Yeah, because the equation is x dot is equal to u 
uh, yeah, the equation, the equation is x dot is equal to u plus uh, the noise, right? So it's x dot minus u minus psi, okay? So is that fine now? Does everybody agree with that? So that be, so now we, what you have to do is you have to average over the noise. Okay, so now we know that, remember that the noise, uh, the noise in my problem zeta, or no, it's xi. The noise in my problem xi of t, xi i of t was equal to uh, a i j uh, of x. So I had a, a i j of x evaluated at time t, right? And I multiplied it by this eta j of t, yeah? That was my noise. So my noise is basically constructed from white noise, yes? It's a sort of matrix product of white noise. So now I have to, I have to ask the question, how do I average out? I have something which looks like the exponential. If I look at the last term, okay, I have something that looks like the... So it's this guy here, right? It's a scalar product. So it basically looks something like, if I write it out, use a compact notation, I have to average something that looks like minus i It's plus i now, right? And I have something that looks like the integral between 0 and t of some function, f, which depends on x of s and uh, yeah, depends on f of x and eta. Okay, so it's some, some function s that has an s dependence, and, and then I've just eta of s, right? I have a term that looks like that. It's the last term in my path integral. It's the term, it's the term that's here, right? See? Zeta has an eta in it. So f is basically uh, a i j time, times x hat, right? So I'll write, it, I'll write it explicitly what it is. So I have to evaluate. You agree the last term has, I can write it in this form. I haven't said what f is. So how do I average this? So the problem is, in principle, right? So this is a subtle point. The x of s... If I was looking at the real trajectory, big X of S, right? So if, I, if this was a function of big X of S, which obeyed the stochastic differential equation, it would actually depend on eta of S, right? And so I'd have to be very careful about correlations between this term and this term. But it doesn't depend, it's just an integration variable, right? It doesn't depend on the path, it just depends on an, in, an integration variable. So this is actually independent of the noise, okay? So when I compute this, this has a delta function correlation. So if I use, if I work out what this is, I use the, the fact that a Gaussian random variable, which is, this is obviously of zero mean, right? So if I have a Gaussian random variable, the expected value of this is just the expected of a hot, okay? A Gaussian random variable, okay? Why is that making noise? Uh, mean zero. Okay, so when I compute this, we've already computed. So when I calculate the correlation function, right, this is just going to give me a factor of two times delta of s minus s prime. So if I work that out, that's just equal to the exponential of minus a half, because there's an i here, and I have the integral between zero and t. This has a delta function. Yeah, so this is eta. This is a vector field. So eta i, eta j gives me nothing. So it just gives me the scalar product of f of s with itself. So averaging over the noise is very easy. Okay? It's just that subtlety. You know, you have to be careful. If, so this is here. This is a function of s, and it's a function of the, the, the integration variable x of s. But it's not a... It's independent of eta. So what I'm doing is you see that I've got this average here, right? 
I want to do this average, right? Here, there's the noise, right? So I want to know how to average over the noise. Oh, I'm going to explain. I'm going to explain. Okay, so if you look at that, if you look at that there, so in, in the path integral here, f, okay, I can write that f of i is equal to a i j um, x s s times, so, so that's what, times x. So if this is j, so I can write that f would be equal to, um, so a i j, so this is the eta, right? So it's equal to a j i times x hat j, yeah? If you look at where the indices are here, right? So let me write it out explicitly, right? The term, the term that was there, the term that was in my exponential was x hat, okay, dot zeta, right? So this is equal to x hat i, a i j, zeta j, right? E to j, sorry. Okay, so this is equal to f dot eta, where the vector f is equal to x hat, so f of j is equal to x hat i a i j, yeah? So that's why I'm doing that. Sorry, which, which term? Yes. That's just the equation of motion. The equation of motion is that A is equal to zero. It's imposing the equation of motion with the delta function. Right? So you're basically fixing this delta function. You're saying, okay, at each step on my path, the equation of motion must be obeyed, right? So you're basically enforcing that with a delta function, okay? But it's an implicit equation. So but you have to just check that the Jacobian is equal to a constant, right? So that's what you're doing. No, 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 because no, because the noise is the noise generated by the seen by the process big X, right? Right, and at little x, this, little x is just uh, it's just an integration variable, so it doesn't depend on the noise, right? No, no, x hat's just an integration. X hat's just x is just a number you put into your calculation, right? It's 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 independent of the process. It's a variable, right? It's like saying if I tell you that the exponential of minus x squared over 2 is a Gaussian distribution, right? The little x in that distribution is independent of the Gaussian random variable, okay? Okay? So, th so that's what you have. And so if you, uh, so you use this now, and so basically this tells you that uh, you can write that px of t, so if I look at the probability of the paths up to time t, over this time interval t, this is equal to, let me write some normalization factor here. Let me put n prime, but it's like dx hat exponential the integral between 0 and t ds. And then I have my equation of motion, which is minus i x hat of s. So you have the term, so what you have is you have the term which was the deterministic part of the equation of motion. Okay. So that was the deterministic part that I had at the very beginning here, okay, so it's just this term here. And then I'm going to have a term which comes from the noise correlation and it's going to be basically equal to a half, you can write it as the integral ds the matrix, so x hat of s, scalar product with the, the product of the matrices, a, matrices ax of s. So I'm writing a is the matrix aij. So you have ax of s, a dagger with the adjoint x of s times x hat of s. 
Okay. So this is just this is just f squared. So this is what the path integral looks like. Okay. So basically, so if you look at a simple case. If you take a case where this matrix A is the identity, right, and U is equal to zero, look at what happens. But you can then do this, you can actually do this X hat S integral, right, because it's a Gaussian integral again. And when you do it, it gives you, you, so this term goes away when U is equal to zero. This term, basically, when you integrate it up, it just squares this term here. So if you have a, if you have a problem where this is just equal to one, you do the integral here, the only thing you get, you can do the x hat integral and you find that uh, p x. So if I set u, a is equal to the ident a is equal to one, right, in one dimension, I can do it in higher dimensions. So a is equal to one, and uh, what else? I said that u is equal to zero, right? So if I look at that. gives you that P, in this case, is equal to this. So, so you have some normalization factor, right? So if I just do it in one dimension, I have a normalization factor. I have d x hat exponential of, so let me see, I said, so I have the integral 0 to t minus i, yes, x hat of s dot x dot of s, right? So u is equal to zero. And then I have a term here which is minus a half times x hat squared of s, ds. So this is, I mean, this is just a Gaussian integral, right? So if I complete the square and do the integral over all the dxs's independently, okay, this basically gives you, okay, you have a normalization factor, but what's left over, so there's no functional integral left over, this gives you, when you integrate this, you basically, you know, this is like a matrix which has a delta function correlation. So if I use the formula for the expectation value of Gaussian random variables, what you find here is the integral between 0 and t, ds. So this term basically just squares up at equal times. Right? So you have the, the probability of seeing the path x over the time t is proportional to some normalization factor times exponential minus a half the integral between 0 and t ds x dot squared of s. Right? So what's that? That's, what's that called? That's called Wiener measure, right? It's the Wiener measure for, for, for Brownian motion. Okay? So this is just telling you that the, 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 the increments of the pure Brownian path, right? Once I take away the drift and the, the multiplicative noise, I'm looking what's the probability of observing a pure Brownian path of the form x of t, right? And so what, what, what I'm actually finding is that this is the integral between 0 and t ds x dot squared of s. But that's normal because when we constructed Brownian motion, I said that xi, if I go to the discrete version of this, right, you can see that if I go to the discrete version, I'm just going to get xi plus 1 minus xi squared, right, when I write down this integral here. Yeah? And you, so this is basically saying that the increments are just Gaussian random variables, which are independent. And what's the variance? Well, you have delta t here. When I do the integral here, I have delta t, but I have a derivative here. So I di divide by delta t squared. So you can see the variance of these in increments. So this is equal to delta x squared divided by delta t. And there's a factor of 2 there. So it basically means that the increments of these Brownian paths are all independent and they have a variance dt, yeah? So everything's fine. You've sort of, you've gone back and you've found the pure Brownian motion. Okay, so this is the martin sigur rose path integral. And so now, if you do it for the stochastic density functional theory, I'll leave it as an exercise, you can average over the noise again Oh, yeah, you can, you, you can. Yeah, so, so basically, so if, you, if you, you're right, you can keep the U, right? So if you keep the U, then uh, 
instead of having x dot here, you've got x dot minus mu. So what you'll have is you'll have x dot minus u all squared, right? Well, actually, no, because, because so what, what, so then you have, then you have to be careful but what, what, about what this path integral means, right? So then what you do is when you, so this is the measure for Brownian motion, which you, this is a measure for Ito Brownian motion, right? So when you expand this guy here, so you see what, what uh, Sanjeev is saying that if I look at the term x dot uh, minus, let's say it's a potential, right? So let, x dot minus phi prime squared, okay? If u was a potential, I would have a term like this. So when you look at this sort of path integral, so let me say, I look at the path integral of a form, okay? So the way to, now what you're looking at this is you say, well, this is equal to e to the minus a half, the integral between zero and t of x dot squared, right? Minus, so you have a term that looks like x dot phi prime, so it's plus x dot phi prime, minus a half the integral between 0 and t of phi prime squared. So this is ds, this is ds, and this is ds, right? So this now is the weight for Brownian motion. So when you look at this functional here, you can say that, so let me see, so I'm doing this, uh, I'm, I'm doing the path integral over all paths. So there's a normalization here. So when I look at this, this is equal to, so I'm looking at this. So what I can say is, so that's the x, I have n here, right? So the point is that this is, this is the measure of Brownian motion, okay? So if I get my norm, if I forget about the normalization, I can say that this guy here is basically equal to the expected value, the average value of the functional of a Brownian motion of minus a half x dot phi prime ds, minus a half the integral between zero and t of phi prime squared ds. Okay, so this is the bare measure, okay? They're saying that this is the expected value, okay? So I, I, I mean, this is just the integral over all paths. It has a normalization. I can, so, so, so I, I, this, this is the normalization. So I'm saying somehow I'm calculating the expected value of over all, over all Brownian paths of this, right? So now, because the x dot squared is here, now this is being interpreted as an average over Brownian motion, right? And the point that you're saying is that, well, so when you look at this x dot phi term here, right, you say, well, actually it's easy, I can just integrate this by parts, this is a complete derivative, I say, so you're going to say, you're going to write that x dot phi prime is equal to um, just phi at the boundaries, right? So if this is a, this is t1, this is t2, this is at t2, this is at t1, right? You're going to do that. But that's not true because you're doing an integral. If I, once I interpret this as the expectation value over Brownian motion, you have to use Ito calculus. So you can't just say that this is equal to d phi. You have to use the formula that d phi by dt, or so you have to use the formula that d phi is equal to phi prime times dx, which is your Brownian path, plus a half phi double prime dx squared, right? So this is the dt term. So that's where the extra term comes from. So if you do the calculation that way, it's fine. So, I mean, there are different ways of seeing it, but the way, one way of seeing it is to say that once you associate this as the measure, right? You say, I'm, I'm looking at the expected value of this functional over Brownian paths, then you, it, this is, in use Zito calculus, and this is where you get the extra term, okay? Right, okay. So, um, So when you look at the SDFT, if you work it out, you find that the probability measure P of X is equal to N. So let me just call the normalization. I never really care about the normalizations, right? So now I had X hat, so X hat becomes rho hat, okay? And I'm going to find the exponential. So now uh, I have D... So I have a ds dx, so I had, if I had a matrix, I had a sum over i for each component of the vector. So sums over vector components become integrals. I have minus i rho hat of x of s times, so the first thing you always find is the deterministic equation of motion. So the equation of motion here is just rho dot minus, so in the sdft, the deterministic equation is just d rho 
uh, rho d beta rho d h by d rho, okay? So that's the term that you find here. And then the noise term, when you work it out, just gives you minus the integral dx ds d times rho x of s, the gradient of rho hat x of s squared. That's what it looks like, okay? So that describes the path. Now, in principle, you could go ahead, you don't really want to go ahead and do the row into the row hat integral in this case, right? Because um, cause actually it doesn't really do you get any good. It brings some strange operator into this term here. So we're not going to do that. So, okay, so why did I do that? I did that because I wanted to show you, yeah? This, oh, this is P rho, yeah. So this, sorry, the notation. What do I write here? Let me see what your notation I'm using. Okay, yes, I wrote x, so this is, this is just so I can get my typos out of my notes, yeah. Okay, so this is p rho of t, okay, t. So that's the probability of observing the density field rho, okay. Now, why did I do that? Well, the thing is that it, it's not necessary, I mean, okay, so having this approach with the path integral means you can analyze the field theory, or the stochastic differential, the SDFT, using field theoretic methods. But the other interesting thing is you can compare, you can you can compare it with other methods. Okay, so what I'm going to do now, this is what I promised uh, Sanjeev and Abhishek that I would do. I'm going to look at SDFT, so chapter three. So I'm looking at SDFT and extensions via path integrals. Okay, so this is a bit strange. So what I did in the previous section is that I wrote down a... Yeah? Oh, right, okay, I should go to yellow. Okay, via uh, path, path integrals. Now, the point is that now what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at some... I'm going to look, if you have some model on a lattice with particles hopping, right, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show how these hopping models can be formulated in terms of path integrals, and in their continuum limit, they give the, they, for, for a hopping model of interacting particles, I'm going to find exactly this path integral measure, right? So it's a way of showing the equivalence. So it's an, an alternative de derivation. So I'm going to take a lattice model where particles hop on a lattice. I'm going to take the continuum limit, so it should become diffusion. And I'm going, to ref I'm going to find this another way. Now, the advantage with the path integral method is that you can generalize it to different sorts of processes. All I've got at the moment is diffusion with interaction, okay? So I can't make particles disappear. I can't have chemical reactions. I can't have splitting of particles. But in the path integral formalism, you can. Sorry, Liz. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah. It, yes, exactly. So in the MSR, so now if I want to work out what some expected value, okay, so if you want to work out what the expected value of some functional is, right? Right, then what you do is you take the probability distribution functional, right? You take, so you take d rho, then you take your probability measure, you take p of rho, okay? And then you integrate it against the functional you're interested in calculating, right? So it's exactly the same as uh, with a, a, a probability density functional. But the thing is, when you want to calculate expectation values, you have to integrate over the field rho, right? So when I want to calculate, so the equivalence here, you see, if I have random variables, if I want to work out the average value of f of x, well, that's just equal to uh, the integral dx, uh, times the probability density functional function now, right? Times the function f of x, right? So you see the equivalence. Okay, so you have... And so this is why the normalization here, I mean, you, okay, so normally what you do is 
rather than worrying about the norm, I mean, you do a perturbative calculation of this guy here without the normalization, but you put him in the denominator, right? Okay. Okay, so I want, I want to look at, uh, try and find another way. Uh, so, so the thing is that lots of people are interested in coarse graining and things like this. And so I imagine I have some sort of lattice model, right? So I'm going to take some sort of lattice. I have K sites on my lattice, okay? So let me see how many sites. Big K sites, right? And let me say I have a certain number of particles. So I'm going to look at identical particles. It can be generalized to non-identical particles. So let me say I have uh, n1, n2, up to nk, right? So this vector is the number ni, is the number of particles. at site i, OK? So you can think of this guy here as being some vector, right, n. So what are the dynamics? So what I'm going to do is, so now I'm on the lattice, so I have discrete space, but I want to have continuous time dynamics. I'm going to have continuous time Markovian dynamics. Okay, so what does that mean? I take some configuration, so n is a configuration given, and I'm going to say there are actually a number of jumps that the system can make. Okay, so I have an ensemble, delta n, given n of jumps that the system can make, make. or changes. So actually, can somebody, so imagine I have a site, if I had a system with two, if I had a system with two lattice points, right? Imagine I have N1 particles here and N2 particles here. So this is the site one and this is the site two, right? Imagine the particles can hop from one site to the other. Okay, so I can have, there is a move here, right, of a particle one particle goes from here to here, okay? So that's a particle hops. From one particle hops from one to two. Okay? Okay, so what's delta n here? If I write delta n the vector, that's equal to... So basically, delta n here means that uh, the site one has lost a particle, right? and site 2 has gained a particle, okay? So not all the delta n's are possible. For instance, if I don't have any particles, if I decide that, uh, you know, my part, I mean, I could, it could be a negative number, right? It doesn't necessarily have to be particle numbers. But uh, so basically, if I have no particle here, then in principle, the transition, there have to be a transition rate associated with this, okay? So these are all the moves possible. And uh, we'll say, of all the moves possible, sorry, there, there are no, no, let me, I'm, I'm going to explain what the time steps are now, right? Let me explain what the time step is, right? Because it's not, uh, they're, not they're not discrete time steps, right? So what I'm going to say is that the system, you look at it, it's like radioactive decay. So basically, I'm going to define W of, so if I'm in the state N, delta N, right? So these are all the delta Ns that are possible. This is going to be the rate at which change. So the change in the system is basically the vector N becomes the vector N plus delta N, right? A unit time. Right? So this means that 
in the time interval between t and t plus delta t. So delta t is, is very small. Okay, well, let's write dt, right? If I look inside that time interval, the probability that n goes to n plus delta n is equal to this rate function, w n delta n times dt. Okay? So this means that uh, if dt is zero, right, nothing can happen. So this is like, this is, a, in fact, what I'm doing is I'm constructing an exponentially distributed set of, I'm, set, I'm creating a set of Poisson processes, right? So basically what it means is that uh, they're all like, every single in change that can happen in the system is like, an, is, is like a, a radioactive decay process, okay? So, so all of these delta n's are given by this. Uh, who can tell me what's the probability nothing happens? What's the probability that nothing happens? That's right. So it's 1 minus the sum over all the possibilities of delta n that can happen. W of n delta n times dt. Does everybody see why you get that? So you missed out a step. What's the step that you would give them if you wanted to give them a supplementary? Yeah, that's so, so the probability that nothing happens, right? The probability that one guy doesn't happen is W minus, the probability that one doesn't happen is w, 1 minus W times delta n1, right? That's the probability that the change n1 doesn't happen times dt, and so, but then you want, to, so that's n1 doesn't happen, then you have to look at the probability that n2 doesn't happen, okay, so that's delta n2 times dt, and then you go to all the changes, right, and because you're interested in things at order dt and not order dt squared, right, when you do this, this just gives you the sum over all the changes, okay, okay, so this is a uh, <coughs> so now if I have a uh, So if I want to work out what's going on now, so these, so these ends are the states, you know, the, the numbers that I associate with the occupation. So let me say that big N T is the random process, okay? This is the random process. Okay, and I'm going to be interested in the probability in the time interval T that I see the trajectory uh, n of t, right? So this is the probability over the interval. So this is the probability of seeing this trajectory n of t, right? Which is going to be obviously some sort of, if I look at one site, it's going to be something which looks discontinuous, right? So if I look at one site, I mean, I, I can't draw the phase space for a, for a big system. So that's the random process. And so I'm going to write that this is equal to, so I'm going to do the same thing now. I'm going to write this as the product. So I'm not going to bother worrying too much. This is the product of overall, product overall time. So it's just going to become a path integral. Um, I'm going to use the Fourier representation of the delta function. So I have 2 pi to the k, so this is a vector, and I have exponential of minus i times the sum over all the times, n hat of t dot, so this is the Fourier variable, and then I want to, so this is my x, little x, right, in my PDF, so I write this n of t here, and I take the random process. So now I'm forcing this, I'm only picking up paths n of t, Okay, so I'm just, I'm just, this is just the product of delta functions, okay, so this is giving the probability of the paths. But actually, I don't really need, so imagine I can calculate this up to some time t. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to say that the probability, now let me try and extend this, the probability up to the time interval t plus dt, 
that I see the state n t plus dt, right? Well, that's equal to, so what I can do is I can write this as, um, so let me just fix the last time step, right? So let me say, so I can say that's the probability that at time t, let me see if I call the path up to time t as nt, right? And I just want to add on the last step here, right? So, this, so I'm not going to use the delta function representation for the earlier time, but I'm just going to put it on for the later time. So then I'm going to take the average value over the last time step. Of, sorry, I, and I forgot I got the average value here, right? So I'm just looking at the probability. So if I say the path is, is n of, its last point is n of t, then I add in a point n of t plus delta t. This gives me dn hat at t plus dt divided by 2 pi to the k, exponential of minus i n hat at t e plus dt, scalar product n at t plus dt, minus big N at time t plus dt. So actually, I should say uh, that what I'm showing you, so actually, when you, when you look at... Um, these sorts of lattice space systems, one of the techniques is have you heard of the doi politi method of looking at these systems? Who's heard of doi politi, right? So, doi politi is an alternative uh, field theory in terms of annihilation creation operators, and it uses coherent states. So, actually, this technique here, I think, is it gives you a field theory, it doesn't give you the same field theory. You can find mappings between the two. But this field theory here was, uh, this was done by. Uh, Usho, Viroli, and Lefebvre. Okay, so this is in 2006. I'll put the reference in the notes. It's explained extremely briefly in their letter. But it, uh, the, where, so they use this method to rederive the stochastic uh, density functional theory. I want to calculate this last expectation. Um, okay. So yes, I, I need to, so basically, so this means that, you know, so I was at N of T, at the last time step, and I'm looking at what happens in the next time step, okay? So I want to calculate this expectation value. <coughs> okay, so when I calculate this expectation value, um, yeah, so I want to look at an object so I want, I want to look at this object uh, here, right? Um, sorry, this object here. So I want to calculate the expectation value. So let me just look at the exponential, okay? Um, so if you want to uh, work it out, I'll give you the answer. I'll do it in the next, or we can do it in the examples class. If you do that, basically what you find is that... Uh, you find a very, very beautiful, so if, I'll just write you the result down. So you find that P of T, N of T, it takes a particularly simple form, becomes equal to some normalization factor times the integral D N hat of T, right? You always have the integral of this variable here. You find the exponential of the integral between zero, or the, I'll just write the integral of DT, I won't put the overall time limits, I find minus i times n hat of t times n dot of t. So that's the first term, looks quite nice. And then the last term is actually very simple. It just takes this form here. It's the sum over all the processes possible, delta n, of exponential of i n hat of t scalar product with delta n minus 1 times the rate w at n of t 
delta n. Okay, so that's what it looks like. So when you're, looking at, when you're looking at this object here, what you have to do is you have to look at all the possible changes in the system, right? So imagine, and the great thing, I think this is really good formalism because it's like Lego. You can add on everything, right? So well, the thing is, what you, what you can do is you can say, well, what happens if, so these are vectors, okay? So what happens if I can have a random walk, okay? From I can jump from this site to this site, right? That specifies a delta n a particle hopping from one site to another, right? You can say what happens if there's a potential. So what you have to do is you have to, cha you have to change the hopping rate to respect detailed balance, right? You can also say what happens if a particle disappears. Imagine you have particles die, right? So that would be a process where, you know, on the site in question, delta n would be equal to, uh, on the site that's in question, you know, you'd have a delta n that looks like 0, 0, minus 1, right? So the really good thing about this formalism is that you can really, it's like a Lego kit of interacting particle systems, right? So the great thing is that you make explicit this sum in this, this is an action here, okay, in the path integral, you make explicit uh, all of the contributions from all the jumps. So if I ask you to do an exercise, if I say, okay, write, me, write down, actually you can perhaps try, write down the, uh, the path integral for random walkers that don't interact, right? You can write that down. I say, okay, now let's say that two particles can kill each other. Okay, write down the, the path integral for that. So basically, you can start off with very simple models and you can add extra effects. Okay, so you can write down each, each one of these terms. You have a class of uh, delta n's that correspond to splitting of particles. You can literally do everything, right? And actually, what actually happens for the, uh, the case of interacting particles is that <coughs> particles hop from net between neighboring sites. So typically these delta n's have ones and minus ones between neighboring sites. So actually when you look at this delta n here, it's always, a when you look at this object here, it's always a difference of two n hats at neighboring sites. And you can say that's small if you, okay, so you can do a Taylor expansion and it, <coughs> so in the case of hopping between sites, actually, you can simplify this expression, and you can see that this is the first term in my density functional field theory, which was rho hat n. <coughs> you take a lattice limit, okay, you take a limit where the lattice size goes to zero, you do a bit of Taylor expansion, so you get the result back, okay? But this is, this is I think this is a really neat formula, and I think this paper isn't sufficiently well known, it was sort of, okay, it's a very useful technique. So are, are there any questions? <coughs> okay, so we'll, uh, we can perhaps do this in the tutorial. <coughs>